and I'm glad Philip Giraldi is with us now on the mother of all talk shows. Philip, uh, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. I've wanted you on the show uh, for a very long time. But before we go into the broader battlefield, I don't know if you heard my monologue, but isn't it emblematic that the Canadian Parliament gave a prolonged and rapturous standing ovation to a fugitive from the Waffen-SS involved in Hitler's Eastern Holocaust in the Canadian Parliament this week. Is this not the apogee or the nadir, the high point or the very bottom of the peculiar position countries like Canada have taken on this war? Well, I think um, in reality, it's demonstrating exactly how this war is not anything like the conventional wars that we've known in the past. This is something that is a political war. It's being fought for political reasons. There were no uh, reasons that um, motivated the Russians to invade that could not have been resolved through negotiations. But the British government and the American government, Canadian government, all had a hand in making sure that that did not happen. So this is a a, a political exchange, which is becoming um, more aggravated, I would say, by the failure of the Ukrainians to uh, very effectively oppose the Russians, and also by the fact that there is an election coming up in the United States in a year's time, and uh, Biden is playing this game of uh, wanting to come out in, in a year as uh, something like a war hero. And this, of course, is ridiculous. And he's going to kill another half a million people in the process. Yeah, I'm I'm always after the fool or knave uh, answer. These Western countries who pushed Ukraine into this conflict, as you and I both agree, did they know it would all end up as badly as it has, that the Russian economy would be outperforming the German economy and so on, that the Ukrainian armed forces, no matter how much materiel is stuffed uh, into their ranks, are simply not going to be able to achieve the war aims stated uh, by the Allies and by Ukraine repeatedly. Uh, so did they know that, in which case the knaves, or did they imagine it was going to end up differently, in which case they're fools? Well, I think they imagined it would en end up differently. I think that's the way to look at it. They, they, they really thought that the, uh, um, the sanctions and other financial and economic pressures they were putting on Russia would be enough to make Russia, uh, if not fold, at least think twice about what it was doing. But it's had the reverse effect, which is basically uh, the Western economies have been hurt by this and uh, Russia has come out on top. So that did not work out very well. And I think they, they also believed the propaganda that they were feeding themselves about how the Russian army uh, was uh, full of uh, soldiers who didn't want to fight, who was poor, that was poorly trained, poorly equipped. Uh, in, in other words, they were seeing Ukraine as a much more formidable opponent of Russia than actually turned out to be the case. The Russian army has performed very effectively, and it's uh, the poor Ukrainians that have been getting caught between a rock and a hard place due to the policies that NATO and the U.S. Uh, and others have been pushing them into. And uh, all of the, all they've been looking at is defeat. And uh, the, the war in terms of military is, is a foregone conclusion now. There is no way, uh, even if NATO were to inter intervene more aggressively, no way this thing is going to get turned around. More and more people are saying that, uh, Philip, uh, even in the House journals of the, uh, of the war party in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the London 
Times in the Daily Telegraph here, uh, in, in, if you like, the fancy newspapers and the uh, so-called flagship broadcasters uh, that are talking to, if you like, the elites in our society, are all now openly saying this is not going to end well. Down at the popular end and the yellow press and so on, you still get the Ukraine is winning uh, propaganda because that's for the masses. But you and I know, and they know, the top people know, this is not going to end well. Why then indulge in these performative public relations exercises, like firing long-range cruise missiles into the Navy headquarters uh, in Sevastopol, which will, of course, change nothing but allows uh, a bit of a thrill to run through the ranks uh, of, uh, of the scribblers, but can only make the final terms of the settlement, and settlement there will presumably have to be, all the more onerous for Ukraine and its backers. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This is uh, where it's going. And, and again, I think you have to look at it right now in terms of this is a game that's being played. And essentially, people like Joe Biden are wanting to come out with an acceptable um, solution at the end of all of this, where Mr. Joe Biden gets reelected president of the United States uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But I think he's going to have uh, a rough ride. The, uh, the, the meetings at the UN in this past week were not a good sign. Um, the, uh, the the reception of Zelensky's speech and of Biden's speech, Zelensky's speech, there was virtually no one there listening. Uh, so he's lost whatever charisma he had. And uh, we have Joe Biden's speech, which just basically uh, said nothing. So you, you, you have essentially the world is starting to wake up to what's going on here. And uh, Biden is essentially uh, trying to ride the horse so he gets out at a, the other end with some kind of uh, solution that will work for him. And this is not just not going to happen. Senator uh, Rand Paul today announced that he is going to do everything in his power, which is considerable, to make sure that this, unless this upcoming tranche of money of $43 billion that was supposed to go to Ukraine uh, will get blocked. So we'll see how that works out. And they, they, the war party just lost uh, another paragon of virtue, presumably. Senator Bob Menendez will not be showing up to vote for more war, weighed down as he is by all the money in his jacket and the gold bars in the backseat of his car. So the uh, arithmetic in the Senate is getting more and more tight. Menendez is only, of course, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the United States of America. You couldn't uh, make this up. Uh, so it's getting tight for them financially uh, on the battlefield in, in Congress. And yet Mitch McConnell, when he's sentient, uh, he's still right glued to President Biden. Is this a kind of octogenarian love affair or what is it that first attracted McConnell? Uh, to uh, to Joe Biden? Well, I think the, the thing that's attracted the two of them to each other is the fact that they've, they've hit their heads so many times lately in falling down that uh, it um, they have something in common there. But, uh, uh, but, you know, reading between the lines on the, the meetings that Zelensky had in Washington, uh, there was no warmth there. Uh, the last time he came through Washington, he received a hero's welcome. Um, uh, standing ovations in Congress. Uh, people were talking about putting a bronze bust of him under the Capitol dome. Uh, and, and this time it was kind of quiet. Uh, McCarthy, for example, did not meet him when he arrived. Uh, he met the two uh, leaders of the Senate, Republican and Democrat. Um, but again, there was not enthusiasm about all this. And um, and there were some other interesting signs that uh, preceded this. There was a, 
article in the uh, New York Times uh, when Zelensky arrived describing how uh, an alleged Russian terrorist attack on a Ukrainian village back on June 6th, uh, which Zelensky claimed was a Russian terrorist attack, turned out, in fact, to be uh, an attack using a Ukrainian missile. So this is very reminiscent of the uh, Polish incident back in April when they claimed that the Poland had been attacked by the Russians. It turned out it had been the Ukrainians. Uh, Zelensky is losing all his credibility, is, is what I'm saying. And the, the surfacing of this article, when he arrived in the United States, was probably a leak from the White House sending a signal. Yeah, uh, as they used to say in music hall, uh, it was a good act, but he's gone on too long. Uh, I think there's little doubt that he's going to be hooked uh, off the stage uh, one way or another. Uh, but looking at that CNN-ABC poll today, putting uh, President Trump 10 points ahead, in other words, uh, and that's before you even factor in that uh, RFK Jr. might well run as an independent, taking a significant number of votes off the Joe Biden column. It's beginning to look like a big change is coming in Washington. And does that not concentrate the minds of the CIA, the FBI, the agencies and so on? Do they not have to now start thinking, well, look, we could be under new management next year? Yeah, that's exactly what they're thinking. And that's what I'm hearing from uh, former colleagues in the national security realm. Uh, they're quite nervous about what's coming up. They know they have essentially sold their souls over, over the last uh, um, eight or 10 years. And, um, you know, there's going to be a comeuppance uh, for all of this. Um, the public in the United States is uh, uh, very aware of how corrupted um, the institutions of government have become. And um, uh, there could be some real surprises in this election. I, I would love to see a, uh, a ticket composed of Kennedy and, uh, and someone else who is as strong on, on uh, the anti-war position as he is, uh, Tulsi Gabbard. I would love to see that. That would be a wonderful ticket uh, indeed. Uh, now, um, you served, shall I say served, uh, in Europe for the CIA. I, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you were doing uh, during those uh, times. You could tell me off air any time that you like. But with your knowledge of Europe, are you surprised at how tamely uh, the European leadership has gone into this abattoir, uh, which has effectively sacrificed their own economies. Is that the Europe that you used to know, or has something changed? I, I, I am surprised by it, and I, I've, I was in Europe quite recently, Eastern Europe, and uh, I was surprised by some of the conversations I had there. Um, I would think that... Um, the corruption we're seeing in the United States, pervasive corruption of the po political system, uh, is also taking place in Europe. There's a lot of uh, criticism of the leadership, or certainly over the last five or six years. And I think this criticism is rooted in what people, what voters are seeing. And um, and, and then for me, I mean, the bottom line, I, I and I will tell you honestly, I worked in counterterrorism the whole time I was in Europe and the Middle East, which I was comfortable with. And um, the um, the thing is, Europeans should be thinking back on the horrors of the Second World War. And they should, you know, the, the slogan never again should apply to that. And the fact that, they're, that their leadership is jumping into this is just, to me, astonishing. And, and trying to justify why they're doing this, the, the arguments about, well, this is a this is to uh, you know protect democracy and things like that. This is all nonsense. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I, I I'm, I'm astonished by it, and uh, but I think the people are turning against it. 
and people like you and your party, I think that the, the signal and the uh, is coming through loud and clear that we are on a wrong course. And uh, hopefully there will be a readjustment. And when the readjustment comes, it will be a serious one. 